Chapters three and four of the Old Man in the Corner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Old Man in the Corner by Baroness Orzy. Chapter three. His deduction. The old man in the corner cocked his funny thin head on one side and looked at Polly. Then he took up his beloved bit of string and deliberately untied every knot he had made in it. When it was quite smooth, he laid it out upon the table. I will take you, if you like, point by point along the line of reasoning which I followed myself, and which will inevitably lead you, as it led me, to the only possible solution of the mystery. First, take this point, he said with nervous restlessness, once more taking up his bit of string, and forming, with each point raised, a series of knots which would have shamed a navigating instructor. Obviously it was impossible for Kershaw not to have been acquainted with Smethurst, since he was fully apprised of the latter's arrival in England by two letters. Now it was clear to me from the first that no one could have written those two letters except Smethurst. You will argue that those two letters were proved not to have been written by the man in the dock. Exactly. Remember, Kershaw was a careless man. He had lost both envelopes. To him they were insignificant. Now it was never disproved that those letters were written by Smethurst. But, suggested Polly, wait a minute, he interrupted, while not number two appeared upon the scene. It was proved that six days after the murder William Kershaw was alive, and visited the Torriani Hotel, where already he was known, and where he conveniently left a pocket-book behind, so that there should be no mistake as to his identity. But it was never questioned where Mr. Francis Smethurst, the millionaire, happened to spend that very same afternoon. "'Surely you don't mean,' gasped the girl. "'One moment, please,' he added triumphantly. "'How did it all come about that the landlord of the Torriani Hotel was brought into court at all? How did Sir Arthur Inglewood, or rather his client, know that William Kershaw had on those two memorable occasions visited the hotel, and that its landlord could bring such convincing evidence forward that would forever exonerate the millionaire from the imputation of murder?' surely i argued the usual means the police the police had kept the whole affair very dark until the arrest at the hotel cecil they did not put into the papers the usual if any one happens to know of the whereabouts etc etc had the landlord of that hotel heard of the disappearance of kershaw through the usual channels he would have put himself in communication with the police sir arthur inglewood produced him how did sir arthur inglewood come on his track surely you don't mean point number four he resumed imperturbably. Mrs. Kershaw was never requested to produce a specimen of her husband's handwriting. Why? Because the police, clever as you say they are, never started on the right tack. They believed William Kershaw to have been murdered. They looked for William Kershaw. On December 31st, what was presumed to be the body of William Kershaw was found by two lightermen. I have shown you a photograph of the place where it was found. Dark and deserted it is in all conscience, is it not? just the place where a bully and a coward could decoy an unsuspecting stranger, murder him first, then rob him of his valuables, his papers, his very identity, and leave him there to rot. The body was found in a disused barge, which had been moored some time against the wall at the foot of these steps. It was in the last stages of decomposition, and of course could not be identified, but the police would have it that it was the body of William Kershaw. It never entered their heads that it was the body of Francis Smethurst, and that William Kershaw was his murderer. Ah! It was cleverly, artistically conceived. Kershaw is a genius. Think of it all. His disguise. Kershaw had a shaggy beard, hair and moustache. He shaved up to his very eyebrows. No wonder that even his wife did not recognize him across the court, and remember she never saw much of his face while he stood in the dock. Kershaw was shabby, slouchy, he stooped. Smethurst, the millionaire, might have served in the Prussian army. Then that lovely trait about going to revisit the Torriani Hotel. Just a few days' grace, in order to purchase moustache and beard and wig, exactly similar to what he had himself shaved off. Making up to look like himself, splendid. Then leaving the pocket-book behind. He, he, he. Kershaw was not murdered. Of course not. He called at the Torriani Hotel six days after the murder, whilst Mr. Smethurst, the millionaire, hobnob in the park with duchesses. Hang such a man! Fie! He fumbled for his hat. With nervous, trembling fingers, he held it deferentially in his hand whilst he rose from the table. 
Polly watched him as he strode up to the desk and paid two pence for his glass of milk and his bun. Soon he disappeared through the shop, while she still found herself hopelessly bewildered, with a number of snapshot photographs before her, still staring at a long piece of string, smothered from end to end in a series of knots, as bewildering, as irritating, as puzzling as the man who had lately sat in the corner. CHAPTER Four, THE ROBBERY IN Phillimore TERRACE Whether Miss Polly Burton really did expect to see the man in the corner that Saturday afternoon, t'were difficult to say. Certain it is that when she found her way to the table close by the window, and realized that he was not there, she felt conscious of an overwhelming sense of disappointment. And yet during the whole of the week she had, with more pride than wisdom, avoided this particular ABC shop. "'I thought you would not keep away very long,' said a quiet voice, close to her ear. She nearly lost her balance. Where in the world had he come from? She certainly had not heard the slightest sound, and yet there he sat in the corner, like a veritable jack-in-the-box, his mild blue eyes staring apologetically at her, his nervous fingers toying with the inevitable bit of string. The waitress brought him his glass of milk and a cheesecake. He ate it in silence, while his piece of string lay idly beside him on the table. When he had finished, he fumbled in his capacious pockets, and drew out the inevitable pocket-book. Placing a small photograph before the girl, he said quietly, "'That is the back of the houses in Phillimore Terrace, which overlook Adam and Eve Mews.' She looked at the photograph, then at him, with a kindly look of indulgent expectancy. "'You will notice that the row of back gardens have each an exit into the mews. These mews are built in the shape of a capital F.' The photograph is taken, looking straight down the short horizontal line, which ends, as you see, in a cul-de-sac. The bottom of the vertical line turns into Phillimore Terrace, and the end of the upper long horizontal line into High Street, Kensington. Now, on that particular night, or rather early morning, of January 15th, Constable D-21, having turned into the mews from Phillimore Terrace, stood for a moment at the angle formed by the long vertical artery of the mews and the short horizontal one which, as I observed before, looks onto the back gardens of the terrace houses and ends in a cul-de-sac. How long D-21 stood at that particular corner he could not exactly say, but he thinks it must have been three or four minutes before he noticed a suspicious-looking individual shambling along under the shadow of the garden walls. He was working his way cautiously in the direction of the cul-de-sac, and D-21, also keeping well within the shadow, went noiselessly after him. He had almost overtaken him, was, in fact, not more than thirty yards from him, when from out of one of the two end houses, number 22 Phillimore Terrace, in fact, a man, in nothing but his nightshirt, rushed out excitedly, and, before D-21 had time to intervene, literally threw himself upon the suspected individual, rolling over and over with him on the hard cobblestones, and frantically shrieking, "'Thief! Thief! Police!' It was some time before the constable succeeded in rescuing the tramp from the excited grip of his assailant, and several minutes before he could make himself heard. "'There, there, that'll do,' he managed to say at last. He gave the man in the shirt a vigorous shove, which silenced him for the moment. "'Leave the man alone now. You mustn't make that noise this time of night, waking up all the folks.' The unfortunate tramp, who in the meanwhile had managed to get onto his feet again, made no attempt to get away. Probably he thought he would stand but a poor chance but the man in the shirt had partly recovered his power of speech, and was now blurting out jerky, half-intelligible sentences. "'I have been robbed! Robbed! I! That is, my master, Mr. Knopf! The desk is open! The diamond's gone! All in my charge! And now they are stolen! That's the thief, I'll swear! I heard him, not three minutes ago! Rush downstairs! The door into the garden was smashed! I ran across the garden! He was sneaking about here still! Thief! Thief! Police! Diamonds! Constable, don't let him go! I'll make you responsible if you let him go. Now then, that'll do, admonished D-21, as soon as he could get a word in. Stop that row, will you? The man in the shirt was gradually recovering from his excitement. Can I give this man in charge? he asked. What for? Burglary and housebreaking. I heard him, I tell you. He must have Mr. Knopf's diamonds about him at this moment. Where is Mr. Knopf? Out of town, groaned the man in the shirt. He went to Brighton last night, and left me in charge, and now this thief has been, and—' 
The tramp shrugged his shoulders, and suddenly, without a word, he quietly began taking off his coat and waistcoat. These he handed across to the constable. Eagerly the man in the shirt fell on them, and turned the ragged pockets inside out. From one of the windows a hilarious voice made some facetious remark, as the tramp with equal solemnity began divesting himself of his nether garments. "'Now then, stop that nonsense!' pronounced D-21 severely. "'What were you doing here this time of night, anyway?' "'The streets o' London is free to the public, ain't they?' queried the tramp. "'This don't lead nowhere, my man.' "'Then I've lost my way, that's all,' growled the man surly. "'And perhaps you'll let me get along now.' By this time a couple of constables had appeared upon the scene. D-21 had no intention of losing sight of his friend the tramp, and the man in the shirt had again made a dash for the latter's collar at the bare idea that he should be allowed to get along. I think D-21 was alive to the humour of the situation. He suggested that Robertson, the man in the nightshirt, should go in and get some clothes on, whilst he himself would wait for the inspector and the detective, whom D-15 would send round from the station immediately. Poor Robertson's teeth were chattering with cold. He had a violent fit of sneezing as D-21 hurried him into the house. The latter, with another constable, remained to watch the burglared premises from back and front, and D-15 took the wretched tramp to the station, with a view to sending an inspector and a detective round immediately. When the two latter gentlemen arrived at number 22, Fillimore Terrace, they found poor old Robertson in bed, shivering and still quite blue. He had got himself a hot drink, but his eyes were streaming and his voice was terribly husky. D-21 had stationed himself in the dining-room, where Robertson had pointed the desk out to him, with its broken lock and scattered contents. Robertson, between his sneezes, gave what account he could of the events which happened immediately before the robbery. His master, Mr. Ferdinand Knopf, he said, was a diamond merchant, and a bachelor. He himself had been in Mr. Knopf's employ for over fifteen years, and was his only indoor servant. A charwoman came every day to do the housework. Last night Mr. Knopf dined at the house of Mr. Shipman, at number 26, lower down. Mr. Shipman is the great jeweller who has his place of business in South Audley Street. By the last post there was a letter with the Brighton postmark, and marked urgent, for Mr. Knopf, and he, Robertson, was just wondering if he should run over to number 26 with it when his master returned. He gave one glance at the contents of the letter, asked for his ABC railway guide, and ordered him, Robertson, to pack his bag at once and fetch him a cab. "'I guessed what it was,' continued Robertson, after another violent fit of sneezing. "'Mr. Knopf has a brother, Mr. Emil Knopf, to whom he is very much attached, and who is a great invalid. He generally goes about from one seaside place to another. He is now at Brighton, and has recently been very ill. If he will take the trouble to go downstairs, I think he will still find the letter lying on the hall table.' "'I read it after Mr. Knopf left. It was not from his brother, but from a gentleman who signed himself J. Collins, M.D.' I don't remember the exact words, but, of course, you'll be able to read the letter. Mr. J. Collins said he had been called in very suddenly to see Mr. Emil Knopf, who, he added, had not many more hours to live, and had begged of the doctor to communicate at once with his brother in London. Before leaving, Mr. Knopf warned me that there were some valuables in his desk, diamonds mostly, and told me to be particularly careful about locking up the house. He often has left me like this in charge of his premises, and usually there have been diamonds in his desk for Mr. Knopf has no regular city office, as he is a commercial traveller. This, briefly, was the gist of the matter which Robertson related to the inspector, with many repetitions and persistent volubility. The detective and inspector, before returning to the station with their report, thought they would call at number 26 on Mr. Shipman, the great jeweller. "'You remember, of course,' added the man in the corner, dreamily contemplating his bit of string, the exciting developments of this extraordinary case— Mr. Arthur Shipman is the head of the firm of Shipman & Company, the wealthy jewellers. He is a widower, and lives very quietly by himself, in his own old-fashioned way, in the small Kensington house, leaving it to his two married sons to keep up the style and swagger befitting the representatives of so wealthy a firm. "'I have only known Mr. Knopf for a very little while,' he explained to the detectives. "'He sold me two or three stones once or twice, I think, but we are both single men, and we have often dined together.' Last night he dined with me. He had that afternoon received a very fine consignment of Brazilian diamonds, as he told me, and knowing how beset I am with callers at my business place, he had brought the stones with him, hoping, perhaps, to do a bit of trade over the nuts and wine. 
"'I bought twenty-five thousand pounds worth of him,' added the jeweller, as if he were speaking of so many farthings, and gave him a cheque across the dinner-table for that amount. I think we were both pleased with our bargain, and we had a final bottle of forty-eight port over it together. Mr. Knopf left me at about nine-thirty, for he knows I go very early to bed, and I took my new stock upstairs with me and locked it up in the safe. I certainly heard nothing of the noise in the mews last night. I sleep on the second floor, in front of the house, and this is the first I have heard of poor Mr. Knopf's loss. At this point of his narrative Mr. Shipman very suddenly paused, and his face became very pale. With a hasty word of excuse he unceremoniously left the room, and the detective heard him running quickly upstairs. Less than two minutes later Mr. Shipman returned. There was no need for him to speak. Both the detective and the inspector guessed the truth in a moment by the look upon his face. "'The diamonds!' he gasped. "'I have been robbed!' End of chapters 3 and 4